And welcome back uh, to another Pixels and Pints up late. Um, as you can tell, we're up very late, judging by the sun streaming through most of our windows. Um, but we are here as well as usual. There is a Peter. Hello. And a Dan. Hello. And tonight, this afternoon, this morning, who knows, time is a construct. Uh, we are going to be focusing on games that we thought exceeded the expectations put out by by gameplay trailers um more focusing on 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 those ones that actually show some gameplay that we think um you know when we first watched them probably be like ah yeah interested but when we actually got sat down and played those games we were like holy crap that is my entire persona for the next uh 48 hours or however long it takes me to play this game um so yeah so we're going to go through uh we've all kind of picked uh between two and two and three uh, trailers to, to look at, some that we've all played, some that I'm not sure, some of them we haven't played, um, and we're going to dive in. This kind of came out from a, a chat we were having about some recent trailers that dropped that we were just like, that some of us just, yeah, didn't didn't think it's going to deliver, and that spiralled mm. into a, a deep, dark rabbit hole as we usually do of, hey, wait, well, what, which other games have we done that haven't, haven't delivered or over-delivered? Um, in this, we will be avoiding purposefully we're not going to be talking about our, our Red Dead Redemption 2. We're not going to be talking about God of War Ragnarok, games that particularly we've all harped on about in the past um, because it would just be us regurgitating the same points that we've done about 18 times. Um, so, yeah, we've all gone and picked some games that we haven't really – we we may have mentioned in previous episodes, but we haven't really done a little spotlight on. And we're going to drink some beers while we do it. Um, well, two, two or three, Danny, you drinking yet? No, not yet. So Pete and I will be having a beverage, if you will, a, a little Sunday treat. What do you um, got? Yeah, that's it. I am going to talk about RDR2 so you can suck a fat one. Well, <laughs> good thing I uh, read the notes. Yep, I, I am well prepared. I you going to say brought your chapstick, but all right. <laughs> no, I'm out of chapstick. I do need to go to the shops. Thank you. Put that on the list. Thank you very much. <laughs> what I've are you got drinking? batteries. Tom? Um, I haven't poured mine yet. Have you poured yours? I have. And well, the, you can go first then. I was the head, rambling. <laughs> the, the head immediately disappeared. I haven't tasted it yet. This is uh, Bacchus Brewing's Tobler Ale, Tobler. which is a 14.0% barley wine, Swiss chocolate barley wine. 14. And, 14. Correct. Fucking hell. Is that the only one you're sipping on this afternoon, or are you going to uh, try and knock back a couple more? We'll see how we go. <laughs> The only beers I have one beer that is not earmarked for a podcast episode that we're recording shortly, um, and it's also I think twelve percent. So I'm not sure that's a great idea. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. No fridge fillers this these is, days. No, no. Um, as I mentioned just before, there is zero head retention. It pretty much poured into the into the glass and instantly just evaporated. Um, super sweet. Um, maybe it's just the way that my brain connects Bacchus brewing beers, but this is, it's, I mean, look, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of sweet chocolate in it. It's uh, described mm -hmm. as Swiss chocolate, um, but it's almost cherry, that real, almost that, that bitter tartness that you get on the edge of a Maranchino cherry. Um, it's unusual. It's not what I expected um, as a, almost an aftertaste, but the actual beer, I mean, it's just like drinking really alcoholic chocolate milk. You can certainly get some of the, the alcohol burn. It is, uh, it's pretty hard to hide 14%, um, but it's pretty fucking good. <laughs> I like um, that you kind of, I don't know if it was an inadverted like slur there as you said that or it was slipping into that <laughs> accent, but it really worked. You're like, 14 is very really fucking good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a four and a half. Ooh. It's going to be interesting. Maybe it'll it'll uh, oh. brighten as it warms up. Four point one standard drinks in a small can. Fuck me. Yep. Well, that's going to need a few more of those, Dan. That's the whole idea of these uh, these one Uplates. one hour one hour and twenty minute episodes. <laughs> yeah, because the, the the booze doesn't really kick in until after we've stopped. Yep. Tom, uh, I am drinking the Rosti Toasty. From, uh, well, it's annoyingly can't see it. There you go. Um, Roasted Toaster from uh, Boat Rocker. 
brewers and distillers. A Fial, which I believe is a coffee coffee roaster, uh, infused and barrel aged Imperial Brown Ale, um, and it is a nice thick. Oh yeah, um, stout cover almost. Almost, but yeah, in the like, it's a bit hard because you guys can't see it. It is a it's- beautiful deep brown. Um, you can kind of see it there. Um, mm. With my little light going into it, it's yeah, it's not as black as 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 you would think for a stout. Instantly, first sip, com- like just that barrelness, that that kind of like really intense barrel aged flavor came straight through. The coffee isn't isn't as pronounced. It's quite rich. Um, it yeah, kind of not what I was expecting. Last couple of brown hours I've had have been bit bit more mellow. This was like a smack in your face of flavor and and a bit of like. A bit of boozy burn. It's it's nine point only nine point eight percent. Yeah, I they aged it in bourbon barrels, which that was I think instantly what I tasted there. Um, that bourbon yes bourbonness rather than the coffee flavor coming through. Um, but it's got a really nice biscuit base. Um, I'm probably before rating it, I'm just going to sit on it for. It is quite cold out of the fridge, so I'll give it another. 20 minutes um, and give it a rating. But, yeah, so far, so good. Nice. Sorry, what was the ABV? Nine point something? 9.8. 9. It is 8. three standard drinks in this little can. Nice. Hmm. All right. Shall we start with our main topic? Let's, Let's dive in. Do it. So, I, I mean, it was Dan's idea. In one of his uh, drug-induced fever dreams of late, his his uh, prescribed drugs, I should state for the record. Yeah, officer. I just, um, uh, I just, uh, I just realised that I haven't actually spoken much in the last two weeks or laughed really at all, and even just a couple of little ooh. chuckles there were giving me a headache. So I've gone and dropped some panadols in some water now. So let's see, see how all this rolls out. <clears throat> <laughs> I need a furanol stat. Um, okay, well, well, do you want to kick us off, Dan, while you're mm. drinking your chamomile tea? Sure, it's green, but anyway, whatever. Uh, um, I don't even know if you two got, you guys have played the games that I put on the list, which is uh, so the two two games. Don't that- take me back to Dragon Age Origins. Yeah, oh, you have- <laughs> I thought Never. Tom just spent a thousand hours fucking. No, that was Inquisition, but I have, oh, I, have okay. I have I have played Origins. Oh, you have played Origins. Yeah. Okay, I didn't. I couldn't remember whether Origins. So my two games that I picked. Uh, older ones because watching the older trailers, they were quite well. Dra- Dragon Age Origins was quite generic fantasy wise. It didn't. It spoke mm-hmm. about the Grey Wardens and the Darkspawn and and the the whole epic journey that has to be going on. And it showed very little of sort of gameplay, even though it was tagged as a gameplay trailer. It did show that sort of chunk of cinematic in game cinematic stuff, not uh, yeah. not pre rendered stuff as well as a little bit of gameplay, but it was kind of just super generic fantasy sort of stuff, stuff you would expect from sort of 80s fantasy movies, nothing sort of out of the way. Uh, and my my other one was Math, the original Mass Effect 1 and its, uh, its original gameplay trailer as well. And it was the same thing. It was kind of just space opery, generic space opery, never really, really touched on the... The, the overall what to expect in terms of storyline yeah i mean th- even the mass effect one said the rogue soldier soldier that threatens the galaxy and yeah mass effect one is about that but it isn't in the in the bigger mm. story that's kind of the mm. the little uh, the smaller main plot and i say that in in yeah. quotation marks uh but they I, for, for me these two both these games well and truly exceeded what they set in the trailers they were generic uninteresting trailers uh which yielded wonderful wonderful games similar and different in their in both rights they're both bioware games which is interesting too um <laughs> but Dra- i mean dragon age origins it even though it has a slightly generic uh plot with the 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 dragon and the darkspawn i can't 100 percent remember the plot but the the mechanics that they modernized from older RPGs uh, to to this kind of one of the first modern um, open world, semi-open world RPGs that happened, God, in the mid-2010s. Mid-2010s, definitely, yeah. yeah. 
mid mid noughties there it was somewhere. PS3, it was PS3 era. Yeah. So it, the gameplay there, so you 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 pick one of uh four two thousand and nine. There we there go. go. Uh, I think it's one of four backstories, uh, and you play through your tutorial section, which takes a couple of hours to get through. sets your sets your story within the world, and the the gameplay is third person fantasy, fantasy exploration. But then you end up with a team of three other party members um, that you can pick from about six or seven total party members. Seven all together. Yeah, yeah, so it's very similar to what we see in Boulders, what Boulders Gate 3 just did. Mm. You have your campsite that you go to at the end of the day and you interact with your your other your other team members and then you pick your main team to go out and they have tanking classes and magic classes and healing classes and everything like that. And But primarily the gameplay was third person controlling your character but then you could hit space bar in my case. I don't know what it was on the uh, PlayStation. Pause in the middle of any combat scenario, uh, issue orders to the rest of your team, um, yeah. and throw the, saying attack this person, drink drink potions, cast spells, support, backup, retreat, whatever you wanted to do uh, in a in a pause in the pause screen. You could sort of move the camera around the, the battlefield at that stage and then unpause it and sort of let it go in a semi semi RTS fashion where you didn't really have to do it. I think you didn't have to keep clicking for attack. You sort of just set your character to attack and he would keep t- continuing to attack until you issued more orders and sent sent them around to your other team members and I think just the scope of the world and the story and then that that not real-time combat but not turn-based combat, so leading into the, the future of what RPG sort of looked like now um, was sort of really revolutionary there. And like I said, just the, the whole scope and scale of Dragon Age Origins was incredible. And the, the, the voice acting... Um, Australia's own uh, Claudia Black plays the uh, Morgana the Witch uh, in it, which is <laughs> fantastic. Um, your your character doesn't have a voiced dialogue, but you pick voice lines when you're interacting with other people, um, which is quite similar, once again, to Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, and I just think it was uh, watching that first trailer, which was or that first gameplay trailer, which was actually really jarring because they had uh, halfway through the trailer it kicked into a Marilyn Manson song um which was fucking odd uh and well, if you got some spare money to to spend on PR then why not license a fucking really popular song uh, for the time yeah i mean it was just it was just just odd it did felt really out of place was Marilyn Manson still popular in 2009 oh yeah and fuck yeah, yeah he was yeah, yeah. Was he? man he's, he he's got a, he's got a he's got a song in John Wick so <laughs> Oh, I yeah, don't know. Tom. <laughs> oh, well, excuse me. I'll just go take out two of my ribs and suck my own dick. <laughs> okay, Prince. I mean, Taff Cap. I mean, Prince again. Um, I mean, Marilyn Manson. <laughs> old wives' tale, but yeah. No. Um, yeah they're yeah. all old wives' tales. Uh, but then you go and watch the cinematic trailer for Dragon Age Origins, which was a completely pre-rendered look, nothing like the game. Uh, and it's got a fucking 30 Seconds to Mars song on it. So it was just... It, wow! On that side of the trailers, it was what a tone change it, uh, from Manson. Yeah, but that was that that was the 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 the, the style of the time. Oh, it definitely was to throw weird songs in your gameplay. It definitely trailers, was, yeah. but it didn't. It was really jarring watching the trailers. I think I don't remember and them the, being. Which is annoying because the soundtrack's beautiful. Yeah, and it's, that's what I mean too. Is I mean you grab you grab a game that's got a wonderful orchestral cinematic styled score and throw yeah. a couple of bands that are popular at the time into the trailers just for the fuck of it. And it's just, it, that was another thing why this, the, the game exceeded expectations for me. I mean, I don't remember them being those trailers having that music at the time, but I would have seen it. Uh, hmm. And it's just going back and watching them today. It was really fucking jarring to, uh, to see that. And um, yeah, I think Dragon Age Orange, I reckon it even holds up today. If people wanted to go back to it, the, the, no, no, Tom's, Tom's shaking nah. his head in disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that it doesn't hold up. I know there are people who have gone back and played it recently and really enjoyed it, but I had the the opposite. I was so intrigued by that trailer. I remember watching that trailer and going out and ordering the game and placing an order down so I could pay it off, and then I remember getting through it and being, I finished 
the story. I never went back and platted it. And I was just like, I cannot wait to finish this story so I can throw this disc out the window. <laughs> I don't know. That that gameplay style really didn't sit well with me. I'd played it I'd played it a few years prior to that in um Final Fantasy twelve. Mm. Also had a similar style of gameplay where it's like you set attacks. I think you could pause it in the same not in the same fashion. Like the way that they gotta give Dragon Age credit there for that's the way you paused it and you moved around the like the, the battle to be like cool I need this guy to go and attack this one and this like that setting orders was was definitely the cooler part but yeah it 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 didn't not exceed expectations in that like sense it was just I was misled by that trailer I thought it was going to be more of a like maybe a bit more third person y Skyrim yeah. but like I wasn't expecting that gameplay from it and yeah um but I can see I know why people love it and and still love it to this day I don't think they ever really got captured that magic again. I mean, two two was a quite a two was worse quite a flop, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it went more third person action RPG, um, yeah. And then three changed quite a bit across the board. Uh, what is and it? who knows what they're going to do with four? And, but they keep teasing it. Yeah, who knows? I am I am very interested to see with all the modern engines and all the information mm. they have these days to see what they actually do with four. I think it could be. Uh, super interesting. I would, I would hazard a guess that the success of Baldur's Gate would have either cemented their plans or made them go, "Oh, hang on a second, yeah. maybe we need to go back to." That. I, don't, yeah. I don't disagree with that. I think it, that mm. will that will have made a huge, huge uh, impact on all their choices. Yeah, and well, no, I, I have no opinion because I've played neither of your two games, Dan. Oh, and so the second one, like I said before, was the original Mass Effect. Um, Sui's memory is fucking shocking, but he's he's also the one that got me onto Mass Effect back in the day. Uh, I did. I don't even re- ever remember seeing this trailer, uh, but I like I said, I went back and watched it today just to get a gauge on. I knew it wouldn't be as good as what the games were. Uh, they mm. they flew under the radar until Mass Effect Two was a, a really cemented. Yeah, hit. I, I started with Two, yeah, because yeah. it was the first one on the PlayStation. As well. Oh, okay, yeah, Mass Effect One must have been a PC only, and. It, it Mass Effect One, not without its bugs at the time, uh, especially the 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 planet side, the Mako, the yeah, Mako the Mako. That's planet, it. I couldn't yeah, remember yeah. what it was. The Mako was shocking. Uh, they've they've completely reworked it for Mass Effect Legendary Edition, uh, which I'm yeah. I'm gonna once I clean up uh, Baldur's Gate Three, I think I'm gonna buy the Mass Effect Legendary Edition and go and nice. play through all three of those. But Mass Effect One, massive space opera, and. It is a massive space opera. It is the absolute fate of humanity. Uh, because they have just released the Legendary Edition, I don't want to spoil it for all those people that may have missed it uh, back in the day and may want to play it. But And intend to play it. Yeah, yeah. but there is a... The, each one of the three games are massive games in their own. Uh, huge. And, and Yeah, massive, huge games in their own. And the story does link all the way through all three of them. Um, and continues on all the way all through three, the three of them. Uh, so it's it's quite a big endeavour to now hit all three in the Legendary Edition, but it's absolutely worth it. Mass Effect 1 was groundbreaking in what it did, even though it flew under the radar for so long. Yeah. Uh, just introducing Shepard and the the choices and his crew and uh, just the, the, the whole world. I mean, you just... The, the whole world and lore that they created around it has just inspired so many cosplayers and artists and everything these days to really sink into the Mass Effect, uh, um, the, the Mass Effect vibe for the whole thing. But mm. it, that trailer was just really uninspiring. It could have just been it, – it, it actually reminded me that I've seen trailers similar to other games that I've gone, oh, yeah, that looks really cool. I wonder if it's going to be like Mass Effect because – you get a lot of these 4K games that um, and RTS games that give you these cinematic boots on the ground kind of follow the soldier into battle trailers. Yeah. And then you go and play it and it's a 4K game that you've got to sit there and play politics and research uh, research tech trees and things like that. And it never <laughs> it never fully fleshes out the way that, that uh, the the third person shooting in Mass Effect does. And, once again, similar to uh, Dragon Age Origins, where you issue water to your teams, and 
I don't know how they've done it in the Legendary Edition, but the first one you could uh, pause in combat as well, flick through your team and issue issue commands and everything. Now, I think they may have adjusted that because I think they made the combat similar through to three. You could kind of. It slowed down. It didn't fully pause. I think you slowed yeah. down. Because you could definitely issue orders to, you know, you'd, it was like um, cover cover based shooting and you would send, you know, Barrack or whoever, and you go, hey, cool, go hide behind this and snipe from there, or you know, you'd send someone else, the Tali, to to throw space magics from somewhere else, or kind of you know, tech hack and stuff. Um, yeah, it's one of those games. I, I wish it had come out originally. Like I dived into two and absolutely lapped it up. Like, um, yeah, there's a the end of two was like stressful. One yeah. of the more stressful moments <laughs> trying to get through a certain mission at the end of two. Um and yeah, it's uh it's a fantastic series. So yeah, Pete, if you haven't played them, I highly recommend yeah. jumping into them. Incredible games, and like they yeah. they deal with some really big themes, especially more so more so two onwards. Mm. Um, there's one you got two crew members in there that uh, different species, and one of them was actually yep. the the species that was the arbitrator of genocide against the other species. Oh, wow. uh, people so yeah. you've got to you've got to make crew choices and moral choices to that scale kind of thing mm. so it's uh it, there's some there's some pretty pretty big choices decisions and choices and themes that are thrown around in the whole thing on a on a galaxy wide galaxy wide scale so it's a uh, yeah. and it's one of those games for for a thing that is meant to be galaxy wide you do go pretty galaxy wide like you go to mm. several systems kind of thing like it's not one of those ones where it's like you get to travel the whole land and it's like there's this one little sandbox map. It's yeah, yeah some of the levels might be smaller, but you do it's get not to like go. um Starfield. Well, we don't know, we haven't yeah. played it. But we assume we we'll take your word for it, yes. <laughs> well, based on everything I'd said. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Assume that I'm not lying through my teeth for a podcast. But there's there's no there's no fast travel. Once you're in uh once you're in the, the Normandy, the the ship, you uh have to go to they're called mass relays. Uh, and they were yeah. set up by an alien race, uh, and it's a—it's basically a jump point, but it's—it's hmm. it's, uh, it's kind of shaped like the Halo energy sword thing, and <laughs> yeah. they fly the Normandy up against the well within its radius kind of it's thing, like a rail gun. Yeah, that's like exactly. It just <laughs> generates power, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's its that's its jump point. And I remember seeing that for the first time because I had no idea about it. You do that first yeah. uh, oh. jump through the mass relay, and it's like. <laughs> The sound effects and the soundscape mm. that they they do on the whole thing, and like even just wandering around the inside of the Normandy uh, and talking to the crew and doing bits and pieces in there. It's uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful games. Um, I highly recommend them. Highly, highly recommend. Them. Yeah, that's me. And you that's get cool. to endorse uh, endorse your favourite shop in the Citadel. Um, <laughs> one of my favourite <laughs> things to do in those games. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird little side missions there. There are some weird little side missions in that. Um, all right, I'm going to jump in for for one. I think I'm just, uh, we can we can split these up. We don't have to do person by person. I don't think. Um, well, well, Dan's spent. Yeah, I know. I realised that after he did both, but yeah, that's fine. Um, hey, <laughs> he I, can talk about some, the, the games that I've. I've played well, all so. the ones that you guys have mentioned, oh, except World of Warcraft. But anyway, yeah. Um, Spoilers. Or Mad Max. Mad Max. The uh, the PS the PS4 Mad Max game. I remember watching the trailer when I came out and thinking, that looks like a really dodgy knockoff of the Mad Max films. <laughs> like, what are they doing? It doesn't look like Max. It doesn't like, yeah, the, 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 the vehicles look kind of odd and the same, but not the same. And like the trailer originally was like more kind of like, it set the start of the story, but it showed you a little bit of uh, the, the, the vehicle combat that you ended up absolutely like loving and craving like as you played mm. the game. But it's definitely one of those games where I, I remember watching it and just going, cool, all right, there's a generic Max character. Um, he's in the desert, uh, you know. Um, it's unfortunate being, being a desert game. I'm just like, oh, good, it's just a whole palette of brown. There's some, <laughs> there's some lighter browns, so maybe a bit of yellow. You were going to say yellow. Maybe some darker some dark browns. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of brown. Um, and then you get into it and it's, you get to craft your own car. The, the the vehicle combat was is some of the best vehicle combat I think I've ever had the pleasure of playing. Um, like it's definitely one of those things. I 
I'm sure I've still got it in my library. I would happily go right now and just drive around and blow up some cars for a little bit. Like it was, it was just so easy. Like once you realize what you needed to do, like through the story and you got to that like 30% mark way through when you, the map opens up and you get to go explore the whole desert, it was just like, oh yeah, I'm going to go blow up some cars in the best ways possible. I'm going to jump off that, throw an explosion down into his car and drive off laughing while his like whole thing explodes. It was just, it was Brilliant. And then the story actually came out of nowhere. At first I thought it was going to be the most generic story ever. And then it was like, oh, this is actually a really cool, like, like love story of man and machine talking about Max trying to get his, you know, get the car back and stuff. Um, and, but it just completely took, it took me by surprise how much I actually enjoyed playing that game once it came out. Um, Cause have you played it, Pete? I know Dan's played it. No, no, I haven't. Yeah. It's so on a very it's- long list of backlog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the flip side to that, uh, I, I watched that trailer that you put the link in the in the chat for, and I'm like, "Fuck, it's just nostalgia." I want to go and play this again. Uh, so, but on the flip side of that, I remember watching the like the 15 minute dev uh, hands on uh, mm. showing of the gameplay, and I was in the same. I'm like, "That looks fucking terrible." Like, that just is so uninspiring and generic and rubbish. Uh, and then, yeah, same thing. When it came out, it was it was just wonderful. The worlds were fantastic. The the fort was, raids it, and everything were great. It it was. I mean, all of these games, in fact, I think that uh, most of these games, um, mm. because we do have some more modern ones. But um, we're in an age where you didn't get eleven trailers through showcases and state of plays yeah. where they go through game mechanics and detail it in gory detail you get your cinematic then your gameplay reveal then your fucking mechanics reveal and no 100 percent. i almost was going to cut it off for myself for like games i was thinking to look at i was trying to go ps3 backwards because it's mm. halfway through the ps4 cycle yeah the showcases started um the way that e3 trailers were delivered were different because you just had more focus on yeah like you said mechanics and, and actual gameplay and devs sitting down and they'll they'll they may be playing like a like well on the way like a beta build but they're, they're still playing the game essentially that you're going to play when you came out um and also yeah, i think the way trailers E3 are delivered now started that yeah and the way trailers are delivered now they are like they're almost a weird art form to themselves like they're short films some of them like a, a and how disco- there's an art form to how disconnected they are to the actual yeah, gameplay absolutely. Too. Well, that's, yeah that's what i think i think a lot of the modern trailers do fall into the opposite bucket where they mm. they try and over deliver uh yeah to, to suck you especially the bigger companies too um yeah uh, ubisoft is the the main culprit here i mean you think back to those mm. ghost recon wildlands trailers uh, or gameplay trailers where they had the the super generic f- f- chat for like but all players. of Call of Duty games fit into that category. Call of Duty, all of those games, even the division, the division. Yeah. yeah, the division was the 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 and first division, the yeah. first easy to identify example for me because I got stuck on the hype train, and there mm. were like fifteen trailers, dev talks, fucking you know, um, ten minutes of gameplay with a squad. There were multiple yep. ones of those. That's that. That's kind of the E3 era that kind of changed the face of trailers. And and I think you know, like we've we've tried to keep this up like fairly positive, but the the opposite of side of that coin really is what we were talking about on chat uh, a few days ago, Dan. It's just the the hype is bigger than the game on purpose. It's designed to capture an audience to buy the the initial game. And then the initial game immediately sets to selling the fucking season pass mm. that you have to continue playing the game before the season ends. It's actually interesting. So, like the the three that we've spoken about so far didn't have anything like that. I mean, I think mm. Mass Effect and Dragon Age may have held, had some DLC, but season pass wasn't even a fucking term back then. No, yeah, no, no it was. And, and micro transactions weren't either. Dragon Age season pass. Oh, okay, I had the Mass Effect season pass. I. <laughs> But the, um, back then, also yeah. the season pass was about because when I talk about season it was DLC, passes, it was DLC, I, yeah. So there's two types of season pass. There's the uh, we plan to release three or four DLC content expansions in the next twelve months. Pre-pay mm-hmm. for it all now in one go, as yeah. opposed to the Call of Duty style season pass. And it's not just COD. Um, uh, what's the Overwatch? 
one and two did the Overwatch, same thing. F- Fortnite, um, where it de- the, where big, it's the des- biggest games of the moment for like, yeah, where it's designed. Sports. Yeah. You, you spend your money in order to qualify to unlock items, but you have to unlock those items before the season closes or they're gone forever. And so the game ends up locking you into this treadmill of FOMO, um, and and then obviously you pay for the next season pass. So it's a different kind of trap. Anyway, sorry, I, I took all, us off the, track. all they do they do the seasons. Seasons things have become massive for any kind of keeping a multiplayer alive. Mm. Um, and one I will like for a game I loved. One that was a really bad theme for it is is Doom Eternal has a horrible season mm. backlog thing. Of yeah, right. Just, um, Battle like, modes. It, none of it. None of it really matters. But it's all just like cool. I want. I want my Doom guy to look like he's crawled out of a lava pit. Yeah. Oh, I can't get that now unless I pay five bucks online. It's like no, fuck you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let, just let me unlock it once the season ends. Go cool. Season's done. You're not going to do that again. Here you go. Everyone have the thing. Like. Yeah. <laughs> so just on that side of it, I did buy the pre order for Mad Max. Back in the day, uh, and I got a beautiful Mad Max steel book with the Interceptor on the front, and oh, it was actually mm. it's the Magnum Opus. It's not the Interceptor, um, no. but it's the Magnum Opus using the Interceptor that you could where you could Body. get the shell yeah. uh, that looks like the Interceptor. Um, so I, I did go in on this before it came out, but that's because mm. I was flying on from the uh, Fury Road pipe train. Ah, see, and was I it around the same I, time? I, was it? Yeah. I, I waited just two years, I think. It was two years before I played it, and then it was released on PlayStation Plus, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember watching that trailer. I'll jump in, and then it was like, why the hell didn't I pick this up at the start? I've, I've waited two years to play this. This is stupid. I like how you describe the, um, the character as a generic Mad Max. I think 10 years ago was around the time that you probably didn't want a video game featuring Mel Gibson because he was in a little trouble for some of the shit that he was saying. They were trying to so, get yes. in. No, you're, you're, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, we're trying to kind of divorce the character from the actor. So originally yeah. uh, Max was actually voiced by an American um, and the Mad Max community and the Australians all kicked up a stink and said, no, this is- That's not fucking this, on, mate. This is absolutely well, they not- That was Cockney, that. so I'm glad yeah. they didn't go to that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you could have just spoken normally there, you. but anyway. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, no, you got to go right, Ocker. They actually then re-recorded uh, Matt, all Max's lines with a with a with an Aussie accent. I don't know if he was an Aussie, but uh, they did get he did put an Aussie accent, and there was calls for it to Mel Gibson's brother to actually uh, voice <laughs> voice, <laughs> voice the it. character. So uh, almost all all Americans doing Aussie accents either end up sounding South African or New Zealander. So. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, problem. Fury Road was released on the in May 2015, and the Mad Max game came out in August 2015. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's okay. what. Yeah, you and I. I played in 2016, I think. Yeah, from memory. Um, but yes, I, I remember the. I think I think it, you can probably find some of the initial, one of the initial gameplay trailers, and it doesn't have the same voice actor they yes. used in the, in the end. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, oh, was the, right. that was the stink that got kicked up because the first trailer came out without without the Aussie. Yep. Uh, yes, I was uh, just... Yep, the Brent Foster voiced him in the end and he's an Australian actor and martial artist. Well done. There you, there you go. go. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Thank you, Wikipedia, for giving me some quick information. <laughs> um, um, all right. Well, that's, yeah, Mad Max, that was, that was one for me. Um, shall I move on to one of mine? Yes, Peter. Please, I, I might. I, I'm going to kind of bundle two together, and and they were the ones that Tom said that we wouldn't talk about. But I'm not going to go into too much detail. So, both Red Dead Redemption Two and Grand Theft Auto Five, um, and it's almost a like it's there's a lot of commonalities in the gameplay trailers that they released. Obviously, both being Rockstar games, in that mm-hmm. they focused on the graphics and the world, but not really the storyline so red dead uh, 2 you know you knew who the main protagonist was almost immediately but the depth of story the 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 i guess the the um the the joy of playing the game that you walk out of that story with was never loaded into the hype train at the start of the game I think there was hype in the sense that it's another Red Dead game and RDR1 was so successful, but it, the the gameplay trailers really didn't betray the depth and the the emotional content and the narrative that they were driving through that game. And I think you know in a in a really different 
kind of presentation in, in, in a different box. It was kind of similar for GTA V. They talk about the fact that you have three characters. They talk about interwoven story. They talk about the mechanics of bank robberies. They talk about all of the extracurricular activities and how you can spend your money and paragliding and fucking yoga and, you know, r- racing bikes and customizing cars. But it never actually goes into the, the hype train and the trailers never really talked about how detailed and intricate and interesting and emotionally hooked that storyline was for those three characters. There's a lot more depth to them than just being two-dimensional pop-outs. You know, I've got the white-collar, white guy, um, middle-aged man dealing with a plastic surgeon, a, 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 a pop-out wife, because that's kind of how they were painted at the start. You've got um, the, the the hood rat, um, the African-American guy, and he's he's presented as a very typical hood rat stereotype, mm. and then you've got the yokel. And yet there's so much more complexity and depth to the actual story that I don't think that any of those trailers betrayed. And that's what I loved about those games, not the mechanics. Yeah, it's really funny hearing you say that is that having played neither of them, um, intending to play RDR2, but hmm. I have no real desire to play GTA. Um, but I've heard so much, and not just from you guys, but like from just you know seeing posts on, on social media and websites and whatever, about how much RDR2 is that emotional game. Mm. Never see anything about that for GTA 5. Yeah, right. The only thing I've ever really seen talk about that is like there's certain moments, but it's more like the the things that I've seen, especially in like, you know, quick little gameplay videos or like little um, streamer things is always either multiplayer stuff and doing stupid things in the multiplayer or it's the like the weird things you find in the world because it's so massive and so like yeah. full and all that kind of stuff, but never really about, or it's all about Trevor being batshit crazy. <laughs> but that's the thing. You don't actually see any of the stuff you just talked about, which is really interesting for me to hear. Like, Yeah, I, yeah. I think the emotional level of the character is quite different. RDR is very oh, uh, yeah. emotional for, for Arthur and the, uh, and the gang, and GTA is more the characters go through quite a bit of, change uh through <laughs> through it but it's not necessarily emotional change uh there's yeah. there's there's change. less there's less there's less depth to it but i still think because it's designed to be a comedy right you're going from a serious drama a western drama to a comedy yes and so there's a level change there yes. as a very a very design. very black comedy uh yes <laughs> yeah. yes but it, but definitely agreed like the all three characters in there trevor michael and I can't remember the third character. Yeah. I Noah? can't remember it. I don't know why I think of that. No. Probably wrong. I'll know it as soon as it will pop pop into my head in a minute. But yeah, there's 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 more there's a lot more to those characters than the surface level. Franklin. Franklin, that's it. Um they 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 have a lot of uh like surface level things, like Pete said, Franklin's Franklin's from the hood, Michael's a retired a uh, criminal that lives Improper. lives in the yeah. lives in the Hollywood Hills, uh, the Vinewood yeah. Hills, and Trevor is just the 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 white trailer trash. But then there's so much happens to give those characters more depth, and you'd grow to love all three of them for their own uh, faults and strengths, uh, and and they all have faults and strengths, which I think is mm. uh, which is absolutely fantastic, and and just they're well written for writers, yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah. wonderful. Right? There's a depth to them, and and none of them think they're the bad guy. They all think they're they're the right. You know, they know they're doing the wrong thing, but they don't think they're e- inherently evil. Um, you know, Michael's trapped in white suburbia, and 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 being an ex crim, like he has to come to terms with that. But he's, yeah, he's just, got his yeah. family. He's got his two kids that he protects in different ways and, through and through fucking the whole- hates at the same time. Yeah, and did terribly hates the kids and the wife, but protects them all as his fatherly duties do. And then hmm. Trevor's got his his mummy issues and, <laughs> and <laughs> all sorts of things. Yeah. And, and then Frank- and, and Franklin's kind of trying to escape, and he thinks he's surrounded by fucking idiots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and trying so, to trying to find a better life for himself, and through the the right or the wrong means. <laughs> and, mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're great characters. Mm. Yeah, cool. Back to you, Tom. 
I'm going to quickly review my beer um, now that it's warmed up a bit and I've I've had a, a more than half of it and I'm feeling nice and I am feeling roasty toasty. Let me tell you, that <laughs> nice warm booziness is kind of all hit 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 the uh, the center of of my head and it's it's all just trickling. It's like the egg effect, you know. It all just feels like it's just rolling down. It's so much better as it warms up. The flavors are a lot more balanced. There's that I'm um, getting a real nice bitterness from the coffee coming through now. Um, and then the sweetness of that bourbon kind of offsets it. So it's a nice little like polar opposite kind of things meeting in the middle. Um, and then just a beautiful biscuit kind of malt base that's, that's coming through there. I'm going to give that a, uh, oh, I'm going to give that 4.75. That's wow. really good as it's, as it's gotten, as it's gotten a bit warmer. Um, yeah, it's, it's very nicely balanced. Um, and that's my fault for not taking it out of the fridge soon enough. But yeah. Whereas... Mine's gone the other way. I mean, the the, the flavor profile hasn't changed. Um, probably, if anything, tastes a bit boozier and less sweet than it did. But the mm. smell is – you remember smelling the lacquer thinner in, in wood class in high school? That real yeah. instantaneous mm-hmm. – yep, that's what you get off the, uh, off the aroma. It's just pure ethanol in that kind of burning up your nose kind of way. That's, I'm still uh, going to drink it. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about your next one? I, I just I just binge-watched the entire season one of Fallout, the TV series, so mm. um, this one's front of mind for me. Yeah, uh, Fallout 4. Um, I obviously, you know, uh, have a massive love of Bethesda games and, and especially especially Skyrim um, and more of their, their fantasy stuff. Um, I remember diving into Fallout 3. I think I lasted maybe an hour, two, and I went, nah, this is weird. I think it was just after I finished Oblivion, so it made sense that it would just be uh, like- Oh, yeah, okay. It didn't, did the, the, the world didn't set. Um, Fallout Christopher- 4 for me- No, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say Fallout 4 for me took maybe two or three goes to get into. I think I started it, got out into the world, got to the, the settlement and went- Okay, um, that's enough. I'll come back to that and didn't for, you know, a year or two. And then I went, oh, I should probably go back and play Fallout 4. I've got some spare time now. I nothing that's really on my release calendar. I'll, I'll go do that. Did the same thing, like, because I would restart a game. Like, I'd mm. go, no, nah, no, nah, I'll start from the beginning. I don't want to start halfway through or not halfway through, but, you know. Um, started fresh, got up to the, the, the town, the settlement, and went, nah, this isn't for me. And then oh, it no. Was, <laughs> uh, and then did it a third time, but it was uh, it was locked down when that happened. And I went, no, 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 you are doing this. Stay with it. And I have. It's one of those ones that I've very, very glad that I actually finally did. I, I fell in love with that world. Um, it's it, but the trailer. I remember seeing it, and I'm just thinking, what's this fucking walking simulator? Like, <laughs> you had the first start, and it's like it's all the fifties, and that trailer especially. It's like. It's the 50s-esque themes and all that stuff coming through and then it cuts to the modern day of the Fallout world. You see dog meat running around. Um, <clears throat> and then it cuts back and then does that back and forth thing a bit and then finally it's, um, it starts showing off the world of, of Fallout 4, the, the, mm. the, the Commonwealth. And it was just like, I don't know if it was meant to be deliberate, but I just remember like there was, they, they didn't show you really the shooting mechanisms. I... I like you just showed you like some brief glimpses of, of the town. So you saw the dugout place you saw like, which was Fenway park. You saw yeah. other parts of the, the Boston and then just walking through things. And it was just like, okay, cool. Do you just walk around a bunch? Like I played a bit of <laughs> fallout, like fallout three, like before I saw this trailer and I'm like, yeah, the, the VAT system, I just didn't understand it. Cause I wasn't paying attention at the time. And I was just like, ah, oh, whatever. Fuck it. I'm not going to do this right now. Um, it's really but then finally, when I when I sat down into it, like every character, like so many of the characters had such rich backgrounds. Like Nick Valentine's my boy. Like <laughs> if I could have any character come to life from that game, I want Nick Valentine just chilling with me like every other day, just being like, "Hey, Nicky, what's going on?" Say, um, is he the detective? Yeah, yeah, the robot detective. Yeah. yeah, he became my like. I sent Dog Meat home because I hated hearing him get shot and squeal. Um, so I sent dog meat home. He's safely, safely in, in the, in the settlement, the, the settlement. And then I, uh, yeah, once I finally got to Nick Valentine, I was like, do you want me pal to the, to the bitter, bitter, bitter end? Um, it's yeah. interesting because 
I think your personal experience or uh, the fact that you hadn't really played Fallout 3 mm. p- probably steered your perception of the Fallout 4 trailer because for those of yeah. us for those of us who had played through Fallout since the original like the original um, yeah. Windows and DOS game um Fallout 4's trailer was was basically just a this is the location you will be playing your next Fallout game in yeah and so it doesn't really go into the combat mechanics because everybody who'd played Fallout 3 knew what the combat mechanics were yeah, going to be yeah. Um, the VAT system is has been in there since Fallout Three, or maybe yeah, Tactics. I really. can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was Three. Yeah. Um. So really, it was just showing you. I think that first trailer, particularly the one you linked, is really mm. about drawing a line in the sand between. Oh, I see what I did there. Between the nice. Fallout Three setting, mm. um, which was similar to Fallout Two, or and yeah. Brotherhood, and or Brotherhood of Steel, and Tactics. Um, so it was kind of divorcing itself from that old setting, and also the the night centric uh, neon lights of Fallout New Vegas. Yep. And so I think really what that trailer was about was there was already a shitload of hype for the next Fallout game, and it was just it was showing existing fans the new mm. world that they'll be playing in. Yeah, that's funny because I haven't that played is exa- Fallout. That is exactly that is exactly why I threw it in there as someone who is new to the Fallout system or Fallout series. Mm. It didn't draw me in, but when I actually finally sat down and played it, it over delivered. Like, I was like, "Wow, wow, wow! This is great!" And like, I've did I did all of it, all the DLCs except for one. I didn't do the. There's one where you become one of the the criminal or the roaming um, ravager parties, and right. yeah, I didn't do that one. But all the other ones of like going in and like extra base building and all that kind of stuff and. Yeah, like I had my full happy settlement in the end. I, I played each storyline to get through, you know, the Synths Brotherhoods and whoever else it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. The Institute yeah. or the Institution. Yeah. I, I actually haven't played Fallout 4, so I platinumed Fallout 3. Mm. I spent maybe 40 hours in New Vegas and just got bored and gave up. Um, yeah. And I'd always intended to go back to 4. I'm actually kind of glad that they're re-releasing it as part of the TV series PR engine. Yes. Um, for yeah, for PlayStation Five because I will play. I'll I'll play and plat Fallout Four now. Hundred and seventy four hours it took me to play. I it. miss I, I miss the fucked up humor that goes all the way back to the original Fallout game. Wandering yeah. through the desert, you would have chance encounters like a mm-hmm. like a wandering monster encounter, Dan from D and D, um, and it would be the. Uh, I can't remember his name. The questioner from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and he would ask you three questions. Um, the bridge, and it was the just, bridge holder, the bridge keeper. Yeah, and it was yeah. just exactly that kind of sense of humor. It's just like how, like, this is such a crossover into completely different, different genre and and different mm. intellectual property. And he would ask you three questions, and sure enough, if you got one wrong, then you would just get absolutely obliterated by a minigun that you couldn't see off screen. Or yep. otherwise, if you got all three questions right, he would just fly up into the sky and land in the pit next to them. That you know the ravine that the bridge was crossing, um, and it's been. A real nostalgic. Um, uh, I can't think of the words because this ABV is way too high on this beer. But it's it's. I, I have fond memories of all of the Fallout games, so I'll have to go back and play Fallout Four. I want Fallout Four's great, and yeah, I would yeah, I would one hundred percent recommend jumping in with this new update that's coming through this next gen mm. update. I want to like Fallout. I've started three Vegas and four several times over, and just get bored of them. Every time I get a little bit further each time uh, and just go, yeah, no, I can't, I can't, I can't drop any more hours into this. It just doesn't do it for me. And I don't know why. So your vault will never have the gek. No, I just, I just, I just, I just can't, I just can't handle them for some reason. It just, uh, yeah, it right. just doesn't tickle my fancy. Uh, I've got the PS3 next to me. Like I would, I'm contemplating, I'd probably go find a copy of Fallout 3 and you can borrow it jump off me. in. I've still got it. <laughs> When you when Wahoo! you return all the other games, <laughs> once I get through my fucking pile, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's why I chucked that one in. Just so like I knew I wasn't on that hype train, and it just like that trailer did nothing for me except go, okay, all right, well the buildings are falling apart, so that's good. Um, the dogs cute, but I'm a sucker for post apocalyptic world settings, and yeah, I've always liked if you if you park the humor and the fucked up black humor that is the Fallout series. Um, the actual setting of the world is, has always been 
quasi realistic and and yep. realistic yep. enough that it gets the hairs standing up on the back of your neck when the fucking Geiger counter goes off when you walk up to a pond of water and um yeah they really captured my imagination from the start and have carried it all the way through so yeah oh it's that's the thing this this trailer didn't did nothing for me but then the game converted me and yeah like I said I'll I'll go back and play the previous version and like hmm. dive into it yeah um do you, you want to talk about again, Peter or uh, do you want me to go? Yeah, no, you talk about control because I've got to take a leak, so I'll be right okay. back. Okay, well, you go go pee out your penis. Um, control. Uh, now, this is a game Dan and I heavily fell in love with, um, but something that completely, I, I think I would have seen a trailer as part of an E3 or something, uh, you know, the year or two before it came out and just... Never registered. It was just like that's weird. That's weird. Shooty, shooty. I'm not. I'm not going to get into that. But by God, am I glad I did. I think that's one of the most interesting and innovative third person shooters I've ever had the pleasure of playing. Completely agree. I I saw bits and pieces of it. It must have been an E3 trailer or something too. And it yeah. it was kind of like yeah yeah cool yeah maybe because um, uh, did you ever play Alan? Because it's part of the Alan Wake. Like no games as well, never, and I never played those. Yeah, no, I never had an Xbox, um, and never played. I, don't know, I can't remember if the original Alan Wake even came out on PC until well afterwards. But I don't, I can't even remember them um, talking about Alan Wake being part of that world to start with. I don't think that came out until later on when people actually played it and started to find the clues hidden. No, within no, the world. it definitely yeah. came out after the game had released. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even when I first got into it, I was my my first maybe hour or two with it because once again knew nothing about it going into it. Um, tried it because there wasn't much else out at the time, so yeah. bought bought a copy, um, jumped into it, and was like, "Yeah, okay, what the fuck is going on? Like, this is super weird, and it's not really explaining much to me." Um, got my ass handed to me by the first boss. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and then once I worked out how to beat that boss and then you, I think you unlocked an ability after that. I can't remember what ability it was. And then, then it was kind of a- That's when you started flying. That's That was the game changer. When you started like levitating a bit. Yeah, I think that wasn't until later though, wasn't it? Or you didn't get the ability to to really hold it until later or something. It was like a jump glide. Yeah. As opposed to and, flying around. Yeah, and once you did get that, that changed the verticality of the game, the verticality of the combat. Yeah. Once you started to unlock the the abilities of the gun too, uh, that was that was all fantastic. And then you sort of just embraced the weirdness of the world and gone, hey, if they don't explain this to me, it's fun. It's it's kind of X Files y and there was a TV show called The Th- Room Thirteen or something like that that Louise got me yeah, onto okay. um uh, not long after we were together, and it's about a, a hotel room that has all the, all the items within the hotel room are inflicted with kind of the same sort of thing that they are in control. Yeah, they all have yeah, some sort yeah. of ability, uh, and I really enjoyed that. It only went for one season; it got cancelled, uh, and it really then ended up reminding me a blend of X Files and and that. And then I started to really yeah. get into it and understand or just appreciate what they were trying to build at that point. And then, yeah, the, the combat was the third person shooting was fun and chunky and, and just a bit, a bit challenging because it was, it did have a little bit of jank to it. Um, but yeah, yeah. It wasn't as smooth as you would hope, but it was hmm. just like, but that kind of added to it in a weird way. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a bit like, especially like um, it was like the dash, the dash ability was really kind of distorted. Mm. Like, I don't know if it, and you know, I'm sure a developer could prove me wrong, but I'm still convinced that it never went the same distance every time. <laughs> like, as in, it wasn't like a set thing. It was just like, you know, you press it and it's like, oh, well, you know, depending on how much like magic ability you had left, like that's how much you did. I, I can't confirm or deny that, but that was always a theory I had of like, oh, I wonder if that's it. Cause it never felt like it was like, I should have been behind that, that block or that like wall. I shouldn't have been shot then. I, I hmm, hang on a second. They might be playing silly buggers with me. And there's so much um, because it's set in the Bureau of Control. There's so much. Uh, there's so much detritus around the place. There's desks and yeah. benches and everything. And you're trying to pick up. You pick up something and throw it at the 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 enemies when they have their shields up to bust the shields, and it just would 
inevitably clip a chair or a table or something through and you'd and get, fly off. Yeah. yeah. You'd get Fuck. frustrated at that. So there was jank on that side of it. But then when the levitation came in, it kind of avoided. And maybe that was a whole I- idea of them that later on when you got mm. the levitate, you could pick it up while you're in the air and directly throw it at them. So maybe it was a, a bit of a design choice as well to do it that way. But to have something set in an, in a, an oversized office building as well was a bit unique. Um, you, you haven't really. It was seen like that. a real combo of the the beauty of the setting of the the dread remake movie. In mm. like, it's the one building you're in. It's multi leveled, and you kind of go up and down through it. But then it's also I don't know if you guys had this, and this might be revealing too much about me. But like, I always had that one. I wa- always wanted my to. It's going to sound really bad to some international listeners. Um, to create like a first person or third person shooter map out of my school. Yep, I know exactly what I just said, and you know, not for that reason, but yeah, like just the way the building was built, it was perfect for those kind of things. Like I remember, like I was playing it's like um, Counter Strike, but at school, and like when we were in school, and it's like, oh man, imagine we could create like a map around this. There was very there dangerous was, nowadays, but you know, whatever. I that's, uh, yeah. So I, I had a when I was a kid, and I still have pretty vivid memories of being a late teen having a fever dream about a weird science fictiony story set in my school um there's movies about what you just described i think it was yeah. called target or tag it was um an old not uh, early 90s mid 80s uh film where they were shooting each other with train yeah it was a it was a um a cold war um spy film Mm. Uh, that starts with a guy, a, a young bloke playing um, uh, like paintball almost in his yeah, school. Yeah, it might yeah. have even been like a, a college or a or a, a university campus. Gene Hackman, Matt Dillon, Gail Honeycutt, 1985, called Target. Yeah, right. So I don't think you're way out there, man. No, no, I know. I just, you know, um, school shootings are bad. Uh, but, yeah, it's yeah. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> But no, it's definitely one of those things like I think of and I remember like when when Call of Duty Zombies started and me and my mates were really into that and we were just like thinking about like places we worked and like creating those into 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 like custom maps. And it's like I, I've plenty of times I've walked into the pub and just like that I'm working at and being like, oh, I know exactly how to defend this from zombies. Like don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a full plan. But these, like, ga- it, these yeah. days there are games that you could do that, though. There are so many builder kits for so many games there that are, I'm yes. certain you could do exactly what you're yeah. describing. Sorry, Dan. But what I think that was, that, was, that was the beauty of con- Control was that it just it was that. it that office kind of building fulfilled, setting. Well, it fulfilled that kind of dream I'd always had of, like, that would be a really cool setting to, to do this, but without the real world kind of, like, awkwardness of it or, you know, sense of guilt, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it did say there's other environmental aspects of it too that made it quite um, fun being in an office building. You'd hit filing cabinets and the the notes and everything would go everywhere. And yes. it just it, visually, it's like the, the cafeteria Almost setting with all the trees. too, when notes would fly. Yeah, out yeah, there was those <laughs> yeah. those aspects of it too. So, and I mean, yeah. it had, had a other dimensional, dimensionality to it too, where you would walk through mm. to other dimensions and almost challenge maps on other dimensions. Some of it was story-based, some of it wasn't. Um, some of it was secret bosses uh, for, for power-ups and things like that. So there was there was a whole bunch of environmental difference outside of the environmental difference within the different levels of the office building, which yeah. was is a very, very cool game. Um, very, very cool. And uh, has a PS5 graphical update as well. Uh, yeah, if right. Any, if anybody's interested into it, I, th- I th- think. Yeah, Peter, it. if you haven't added that one to your list, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, it's on my list because you guys have hyped it up so much. <laughs> it's so. not particularly long either. Uh, you could, you can. I remember you it saying that in, before too. In sort of ten or twelve hours, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. It's, uh, I got the platinum forty hours. God, I love my trophy app. That's so good. <laughs> I've got a four day weekend coming up for Anzac oh, Day, so I might smash on. it out. He's on. Yeah. Um, that's me. Yeah, Pete. What do you got? Yeah, sorry, I misread your your show notes. I thought you had four games, but you've actually got two two different no, trailers, two trailers for, for Control. For control so that's yeah. that's my bad. I would have just held it a bit longer to talk about Ghost of Tsushima. No, so let's jump in. I, I know that there's some contention around this. Dan, I think disagrees. Uh, Tom may disagree, but for me, Ghost of Tsushima's gameplay trailer 
didn't really like it certainly portrays the beauty of the Japanese setting mm-hmm. and it portrays the the barbaric you know samurai combat but it to me it didn't really portray the parts of the game that I enjoyed and that is the the zen calmness and that almost ASMR soundscape that it created throughout the game uh, nor the importance of the story to me I'll, you know we talk about emotional narrative story games as as probably maybe it's just our age but you know we've played that many action combat games where there is no real narrative and and we've kind of gotten yeah. over that and i think we we probably gravitate towards something with a little bit more depth these days but to me ghost of tsushima really hit home with the narrative context and with that zen like re- relaxation while you're traveling through the world that i don't I didn't get from the trailer. There was no real hype for me. It was just another Ronin game, whatever that means. It's another samurai game. So that's why yeah. I included it in my list. I think for me, like just what I talked about just before we started recording was the um, it showed a little bit of that, like obviously that trailer, like we kind of discussed, was a bit preset. It was it was mm. it was a, it was a mold kind of thing. It like wasn't what you naturally occurred in the game and um I'm sure there are better trailers for that or now obviously just people showing their own gameplay but <clears throat> like I said that one that one I think that first thing that I fell in love with of that game was when he jumps when Jin jumps on the horse and just starts riding through that long grass and you got wind flowing behind you and that I was like oh I will I will ride through that for hours doing nothing like and I did I spent so many didn't hours me the riding way you yeah, I don't, yeah, and I, mean, I didn't appreciate. I like it was pretty, but I didn't yeah. appreciate the depth to that. It that actually, I think, of- thinking back on it, it really threw me back to being younger and playing um, some of the Zelda games and just jumping on a pona and riding around the fields. Like that was a massive part of like Ocarina of Time. Like you had to use the horse to get around. Um, and I'm a sucker for any game that has a horse. I'm I'm in 100. percent Let me ride a horse around. Like I, I love it. But yeah, I just remember seeing that, and it was just like the over-the-top windness, and and I think that's a, a, a term we can use for <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima. Like yep. the wind is over the top um, in the way it's it's displayed. But like I rem- that I remember like seeing that, and it was just like, oh yeah, that's that's the scene I want to be. I want to spend time in that. It was the same mm-hmm. as when I first saw like Black Flag and the sailing. Like I was like, oh, I want to go sail the Caribbean on a ship, and I did that for hours too. It's just one of those things, yeah. like. It's not story related. It's it does nothing for the game. It just it does thing. It's just for me. That's my that's my thing. I'll happily spend two hours just sailing around, riding around, doing whatever. Um, it's just enjoyable. Yeah, I think I, none of the AC games made the list because it was just a, a a mental amount of fucking hype in the lead up to those games. So that excludes them automatically, whether yes, they deliver yeah. or not. Um, Dan, you had an alternate opinion on Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah, I mean, I just thought that that original gameplay look, it was, once again, I think it was going back, it was an E3 trailer. Uh, it was it just was. It was just a bit misleading uh, to, to how the, the gameplay and the combat played out. Uh, just it was that that trailer showed it to be far more cinematic uh, and closer up camera-wise, uh, much more like a film than it did played, played like a video game. I would love to see this done like if they could remaster mm. ghost of Tsushima, like and i know they won't and i'm not saying they they need to um but this is if they converted the current game which i absolutely loved uh to an update like uh, how that that gameplay trailer looks uh with a closer camera tighter combat and much more one-on-one combat more than the arkham sort of style combat that it yeah. was um, it kind of gives me ideas of this is what they did with The Witcher 3 in the enhanced edition um, that they re- released last year, which is basically what they did. They tightened the camera into more of a over-the-shoulder God of War style, mm. uh, pull, pulled it all pulled it all in tighter, which is what they mm. could do with Ghost of Tsushima and give it that um, give it that that camera angle. I'd love to see that more cinematic camera angle. I mean, the game was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. I just don't think maybe that's maybe that's what's going to happen in two. They'll they'll pull that in potentially. Maybe yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the 
I think that that gameplay trailer was also a little bit misleading in how much the game ended up leading in leaning into the ghost uh, mechanics and the things that you you had to the missions you had to do as the ghost. We've gone over it before. I definitely yeah. chose the 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 well, that was a choice. The, uh... the choice of the <laughs> the samurai path, even though it wasn't yeah. really a choice. It wasn't a a set in con concrete gameplay choice i just chose no, to no, play it it was that an way. enduring choice that you yes. made over and over yeah. Yeah. yeah uh so that was that was just something that i felt that gameplay trailer kind of misled uh misled uh mm. misled with but i mean either way it's a fucking fantastic i guess game. only in the sense of that's mm. the way that sucker punch wanted you to play it they wanted you to lean into the ghost i think more oh, so I- <sighs> If if you look at that trailer, it spends a decent amount of time in that that combat with those six or seven troops, and hmm. you could tell having played the game. Obviously, they removed the the prompts and the GUI, but you could tell that that very first attack from your your Ronin was hmm. that that standoff um, mechanic, hmm. and yeah. then all of the other fighting was just him fighting. So. You know, I think they balanced that against that's the loud combat style, if you like, versus the the next sequence, which was set on the rooftops and him really sneaking around as a ghost. Yeah. So I think it was fairly balanced as a as a trailer, but to me, oh. it makes the grade because there wasn't really a super amount of hype. We were looking forward to it, but it oh, wasn't. Oh, mate, for it me, wasn't I was, Ubisoft I was... hype. Oh no! Yeah. It, it dwarfed anything that Ubisoft ever done for me. I was I was champing at the bit for that to come out. I I, I definitely got that day one and jumped straight in. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. and and there hadn't been anything Japanese on that scale before. Yeah, you know? so it was, it was it was something. It was something, especially fresh when you think back to it world. now and like compare to it to like Rise of Ronin, which has just come out, and it's mm. just been the trailers have actually made it more. It feels more disappointing. It's like I actually. I'm not keen to jump into that yeah, right now. Me either. It's something that I may, I'll probably play eventually, but um, I think back to when Ghost was getting announced and, and released and I was like, holy shit, I can't wait to play that. Like that was definitely one for me that like was, it didn't necessarily exceed expectations, but it, it hit them. It hit them, I guess, is probably the better way yeah. to put it. Yeah. Yeah, fair um, enough. Can be, yeah, compared to some other games that have, yeah. The only other one I wanted, I didn't put in the show notes, but I thought might hit all three of us is Days Gone. I I don't know if that's there, one for you guys. I mean, that there ever was flew no under hype. the radar. The, the, yeah, there was absolutely there was no hype behind it. Yeah, there, but I'm not sure if that's more a case of, and I I don't think it is. But like I think that's definitely a case of us selling it to each other at the time, and like uh, it's a, it was. The only reason it came back and the only reason any of us played it was because it was it was released for free on the PlayStation Plus, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I bought it day one. Oh, did you? Yeah. Were you hyped for it before? Yeah. It was I think it was another one of those I'm bored, there's nothing else to play. Let's give this a go. I I bought it and played a little bit of it and then didn't show it to the didn't, side. Didn't play yeah. it for <clears throat> probably another two years. Didn't finish it yeah, for right. another two years, but I had a copy of it from yeah, from basically day one. From day one, yeah. Whereas Tom, did you did you oh, first no, hear about was, it? I remember. I remember when it first was announced. Like obviously, I, I, I love a good gameplay trailer when it comes out. Um, I remember hearing about it and going, "Oh yeah," but I remember it was like it was around the time of like. So I with the share house I lived in, we were obsessed with with the original COD Zombies. Like it was like our favorite thing to play. Couch co-op, but then also yeah. online with two other mates who are couch co-op. Um, endless hours of just running around shooting zombies. And so when this, I think, was coming out, it was kind of as COD zombies started to become really complicated and they started adding like this storyline to it compared to just your four soldiers trapped in a in a finite area and it's a horde mode. Um, and I remember that going like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Oh, yeah, there's a bike guy. Um, Oh, it's Sam Whitwell. I like Sam Whitwell. That's cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that was about as far as I went until it was ninety percent certain I got it as a uh, it was a PS Plus game, and then I dived into it. And obviously, but that was it was wasn't a it was initial slow burn, 
But then, dear God, did like, you know, 20 seconds into that week, did someone pour some gasoline on it? Because it just went, whoa, okay, we're in now. We're hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Everything I'm doing now is days gone. I am a Seattle zombie hunter in the wilderness on a motorbike. Nothing else it matters. Was, like, it, yeah. it must have gone to to PlayStation Plus library pretty quickly because it, it was only released in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. To a pretty mediocre reception, and then all of a sudden it exploded out of nowhere way after the game had been released. Yeah, it did. And it, I think that look, I remember seeing that original gameplay trailer where they showed uh, him fighting the Horde, and I'm just like, mm. that's just fuck it, that's bullshit. Like this is this is there is absolutely no way that is going to be part of the game. The way the game, that yeah, plays. the way the way it plays out, and it's and I'm just mm. like, I call total bullshit on this, and. How wrong I was. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was obviously designed to capitalise on the Walking Dead fever yeah. at the time. I it mean, was about it was- two years after release. So it was released in April 2019 and it was the mm-hmm. April 2021 PS Plus game. And I think it probably, I'm fairly sure I remember reading that it picked up more fans from that PlayStation Plus release than it ever had originally. Mm. Oh, I remember it's one of those ones that, like, after seeing the trailer, I, I remember looking at it and going, um, no, nah, I've got something else to play. I think it was one everyone of those was, ones that, like, it was really set on the fence. I think everyone was kind of Walking Deaded out by that stage, too, because Walking Dead oh, was, yeah. it was oh, the yeah. ninth year of Walking Dead at the time. And that was, you know, people had dropped off at season five, six. Mm. So, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And it definitely held that vibe. But yeah, I mean, fantastic game. Yeah, fuck Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I still have nostalgic memories of it. I, I would like to go back and play it, but there are so many games in my yeah. list that I never will. I've got one last one, and I'm not going to mm-hmm. harp on about game mechanics like I have before, uh, but fun. certainly ga- games that exceeded expectations and over-delivered on the hype. Um, so World of Warcraft, for me, made that list. And if you go back and watch the trailer, the gameplay trailer that I, I linked for you guys, Mm-hmm. The gameplay trailer is a tragic mess of fly-throughs of poxy graphics, which were groundbreaking at the time, in in fairness, and gameplay with zero explanation. It shows everything that I hate about MMOs in that trailer. And at the time, so when when Blizzard announced that they were- 2004 as well. Yeah. When 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 Blizzard announced they were making an MMO based on the the, uh, Warcraft- franchise of the Warcraft IP, there was a collective fucking groan. Because at the time, the the big MMOs of the day, there was uh, Dark Age of Camelot or Dayok. There was EverQuest. EverQuest 2 came out at almost the same day as World of Warcraft. And there was Asheron's Call. And EQ and Asheron's Call or AC were pretty tragically bad MMOs. Dayok had some cool mechanics, some uh, castle siege mechanics that they're still implementing today. But I I think everyone just kind of groaned at, oh, they're just cashing in. It's fucking typical crap from big game studios. You know, there's a lot of of support for the uh, the Warcraft games. Now they're just going to make a really shit MMO. Mm. And it literally changed the face of gaming for, for online games. It defined its own kind of... The, it redefined the standard for how enjoyable and how much in-depth narrative you could get out of an MMO that was online. It changed the face of live service games forever. Um, I think it definitely fits. I, I, you know, I could spend five no, or 50 minutes fits, talking yeah. about it, but I, I think it fits in terms of games that over-delivered on the hype. The only thing is I can't watch that trailer and not think of Leroy Jenkins. Just, I see those graphics again. Because it's the original, the it's the OG yeah. poxy graphics, yeah. 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 Well, I, I get nostalgic too. And I didn't get into uh, WoW until the first DLC, which was, mm. I think, 18 months after the game came out. So I was not yeah, an OG I, player. Uh, no, and I've obviously never played it, but I, I remember f- I had a really good time. Weirdly, one of the best work experiences I've ever had was when I was working at EB when one of the um, expansions came out and just – talking to the people about just how excited they were for coming in and ordering it and getting it ready and, like, all the stuff. I did the midnight launch for it kind of thing and it was just like, holy crap, like, that's great. Like, and they just, there's all these, all these, like, the girls and guys are just there just being like, 
I cannot wait. Like, can give me my copy now. I need to get home and play it. I've like, I've taken the weekend off work. I'm like, sir, it's a Wednesday. And they're like, I don't care. I've taken the rest of the week off work. Like I need to put as much time into it. It's just, it was that passion. I was just like, fuck yeah, that's it. And then like, yeah, like I, I, I have a lot of time for that community. I think they're just, they're just great at that. It's the only game that I've ever lined up to for a midnight launch to buy. Mm. So I didn't do, like I said, I didn't, I didn't play the game at, at, at launch. Yep. I bought, uh, I bought into it just as Burning Crusade released. Mm-hmm. And then I lined up for Wrath of Lich King, Cataclysm, Mists of Pandaria and Warlords. Cataclysm, of, that was it. That was the one I did. Yeah. And Warlords of Draenor. Draenor. Um, so, so four DLCs I, I lined up at midnight to make sure that I got my collector's edition of the, mm-hmm. the DLC. And the yep. only other thing I've ever lined up for was the PlayStation 4 Yeah, at JB Hi-Fi. That's it. So it's the only game that I've ever queued up for. Do you ever think we'll ever see the return of that? I don't think we will. No. no. The world changed. Yeah. The even, world has even, permanently changed. Even midnight releases. No, because every, everyone's, everyone's like now, there's so, so many people who um, pre-order it online and preload it through the, yeah, the PlayStation course. Store or yeah. Xbox Store and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Pay three times more. <laughs> Everything on the Absolutely, PlayStation yeah. Store is more expensive than buying. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the brick and mortar stores, like those lineup events, like I did a few of them when I worked at EB. Like, I did a couple of COD ones where it was like we had a we got given a demo disc and we had that one console on the store and Macquarie Center, and mm. you would just have a crowd of people like going, oh, it's and like we had one of our staff was there to go, yep, you died, controller over, go back to the back of the line, you can play again <laughs> soon. Like yeah, it was just that, and it was just yeah. But no, I don't think we'll have we'll ever have that again. Um, I don't. Yeah. I'm Different not, industries, I think, still have it, but yeah, not not the gaming industry yeah. or or movies, or really. Movies, yeah. like, I don't. Well, I think everything on that side of it's pretty much burnt out these days. I mean, you yeah. you you would never get a huge hype for a Star Wars cinematic release like you did previously because there's so much on Disney Plus. It's not like there's a ten year drought now between. It's things. just a saturated channel. Yeah. Or, yeah, well, this thing, it's the thing of like we've talked about with some movie releases before. We've gone so off topic. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, we, we're done talking about our, no, no, our no. games. But anyway. like, well, like we've talked about before, it's like, oh, I could go to see this at the movies or I could get the day one. I can pay a movie ticket price to watch it at home kind of thing now. And that's you could buy it for 30 do. bucks. Yeah, yeah. You could, you could you know, sit in gold class for 54 or you could buy it for 30 bucks. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, it's like trying to. Trying to drive a speedboat in a bathtub sometimes, but you can do it. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Very messy. I mean, I, I think I, I think COVID COVID probably put a nail in the coffin for some of these these in person hyped up community events. Yeah, that were that were already losing energy. They were already kind of petering out, and then COVID just killed it. So I think they also they switched from game releases to things like esports. I think a lot of the gaming community. You know, especially the younger game community have switched to those esport events because um, I I know there there's that fortress bar in, in like central and they're there's doing still esports no, events that like people go to line up for to get to get seats to sit in and stuff. There's still you, no you KO see those stadiums for, that get filled and stuff. Yeah, there's still no KO for esports in Australia though. There's no there's no esports TV channel like there is in the US and Korea and if, is it not know, on KO? Other- I thought they did add something. I thought I heard that they were adding it to one of them or It's not advertised as such. It, Maybe they there, might yeah. have, but I'll do so, some research, um, have a look around. Yeah. Apparently BlizzCon BlizzCon stopped for four years. That was the one of the OG. Well, I think the cons the cons definitely they died. But like, that's a, th- th- thanks to COVID and, and E3 yeah. being shit for years and that kind well, of Well, I think they were already dying and COVID just put the nail in the coffin though. Because yeah. E three had run out of steam. I remember us sitting down for for podcast episodes and getting to the end it's like is there even an episode in this content because yeah. we sat there and groaned for three hours about how shit everything looked and i mean i guess this re re-emphasizes what we've been talking about this entire episode and got brought up halfway through i mean you, you talk about even um tom's best mate uh jeff keely that runs his uh runs his games Awards each <laughs> runs his <laughs> sneaky, sneaky, snoy, snoy. Uh, runs his runs his game awards each year. I mean, the 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 
a amount of shit that we watch trailers there now and go, yeah, yeah. okay, whatever. I mean, it's just. I just, just think gamers are exhausted. Fuck, with he's the hype a wank stain, though. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. but but I mean, look. Personal attacks on on douchebags aside, I think I think gamers have wisened up that no matter how, like every name a gamer who hasn't been super excited about a game release and then been utterly disappointed when it actually came out. Yeah, yeah. It's just that the, the industry has under delivered and underwhelmed for such an extended period of times. Yeah, there are gems. I'm because I'm they're promising now, too but, much. It's definitely that but, they're promising. But too it's much. almost like that they put fifty percent of their their development fund into PR and forget to finish the mm. fucking game. Mm. And yeah. I think gamers for I, I think it got to a point where gamers accepted that behavior without pushing back, and it's only recently they've started saying, you know what. There's a bunch of really sick indie games out there for a third of the price, and they will actually give me a gaming experience I'll enjoy. I don't need to spend $130 on this game anymore. Mm. Yeah. I, I think the, the the what I'm playing at the moment banishes Ghosts of New Eden. Like, I saw mm. those trailers. I think it was at the Game Awards or something like that. I forget where I originally saw no, it. I remember, I remember we shared a trailer around it. Yeah. I remember that one. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that looks cool. Let's just see how much of that actually translates through to the game. The game's incredible. Like, I yeah. absolutely love it. And, like, the devs of like, I didn't include it on this list. One, because I haven't finished it. Two, because I want to do the yep. breakdown in the, the, main, uh, the main review uh, yep. podcast episode. But yep. the the amount of love these it's the same reason H D uh, Helldivers two isn't on this yeah. list. So the main reason uh, the, the the you can see the love that the devs have put into every aspect of this this game and like I there's so many dialogue lines recorded I can't tell whether they've actually repeated dialogue lines in like summoning of ghosts or things like that mm. because there's so mm. much out mm. there. There is some Gaelic lines that I I like the sound of Gaelic so I've twinged each time they've said Gaelic and I've seen a couple of them come up, but they've they've obviously gone, let's take all the knowledge of previous that we've learnt and people have said they hate repetitiveness and like it throws them out and everything. Let's let's not do that. Let's record a bunch of lines. And because it is a very heavily scripted linear game, I guess they could go, okay, when the player gets to this, this is the specific line for the summoning that ghost in this area, uh, even though you've yeah. done it a couple of times before. They're kind of like challenge areas. Um, mm, yeah. let's, let's, there was a let's, bit of hype into that game, though. Oh, there wasn't much. There was a couple of trailers, a couple of really flashy trailers. it was more trailers. us looking at it going, like, that was our, like in our, we in talked our about personal yeah. chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the other thing that really gets me, too, is I know we're off topic here and I'll pull the pin on this straight after this, is they've just they've animated everything. Like it's it's exactly like God of War where there's no break in the lo- like for load screens. If you yeah, if you okay. fast travel, yes, there's a break there because it's an instantaneous fast travel. There's only a break there, but like the, you, you do a travel between uh, the real world and the the void, uh, and there's a specific cutscene that happens for him going into the into the void to hide the load screen, but it's it's contextual. Yep. So it it is purposeful for. Well, it's like it's like when the when when Geralt sits at the campfire to move time. Like, yeah, it, it, you know, yeah. it's a similar thing. Similar, like it yeah. adds it adds to the experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Completely yeah. agree. And I, I think that's just a, my my last quick thing about a trailer that outdid the hype. The the game's hmm. outdone the hype for it. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Well, I think, I think we. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's a good good app. Sounds good. I'm toasty and drunk now, so I think I'm going to crack another tenner and go play some Helldivers too. <laughs> you did do it, uh, you dirty dog. <laughs> if you made it this far, thank you very much for listening. Yep. Thank you. Yes. See you next time. And let us know in the comments, if you like and subscribe, games that you feel didn't live up to the hype. No, lived up to the hype. Exceeded the hype. Exceeded. You can let us know the game. You can also let, let us, us know the, if the, you the, remember the topic better than yeah, Tom did. we're still not sure what we're doing, but anyway. <laughs> Look. If you liked a game, let us know. We'll play it if we haven't played it, and then we'll let you know if we liked it or if we think how much we hated it. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you, See Jeff Keeley. Bye.